Hey folks, it's Andy, the analytical preacher again with the second part of our podcast on bigotry and racism and discrimination. In the first podcast, we really looked at how aggressively the Bible works against these concepts. We defined the terms of bigotry and racism and discrimination. And so in this second part, I wanted to go back and look at three important points. So if you said to uh, Jesus, I think, were you concerned about these concepts? He would say, yes, read these scriptures. He would give you some of the scriptures that I read. He would explain how bad they are. And then I think Jesus would say, so if that's a concern of yours, if it's an area that's come up, let me give you sort of three points that I think can help you along here. And the first point is simply this. It's important that we understand that all sins, including bigotry, they ultimately come from within us. And this is important to understand because the Bible says we are not to blame other people for the wrong that we do. And the Bible also would teach us, would warn us against trying to develop some utopian society. It's simply not going to be possible to develop a society where if we handle children the right way or teach them exactly this way or force them to do that, that we could eliminate all bigotry, all racism, all discrimination. It's simply not going to happen. Here's one verse of about 50 that I could read you that just kind of speaks to this. In the book of James in the New Testament, uh, the first chapter, starting in verse 14, James says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. In other words, it's coming from inside of you. Jesus says the same thing. Like Look at Mark chapter 7, for example. That's important for us to understand. Academic research has come to similar conclusions. Um, there's an older book written by a psychology professor who was at Harvard, I mean, literally four or five decades ago, a gentleman named Gordon Allport. He wrote a book called The Nature of Prejudice. And in that book, he sort of comes to the same conclusion. It's really coming from in us, but here's the problem. Even though it comes from within us, it can be amplified or exacerbated by a number of different things around us. And so I think Jesus would just say, I need you to understand and I need you to be careful. Let me just, within this first point, let me give you a few of the things that can sort of amplify this bigotry that might already be kind of bubbling inside of us. When we, ha- we just have to understand when there are differences among groups. And especially if the groups aren't very familiar with each other, there's almost this natural caution that comes up. Hey, who are these people? They don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They don't act like me. They're not treating their kids like me. Who are these people? And there's sort of this natural caution. And if we're not very careful, that natural caution can actually grow into fear Fear can actually turn into hatred. So we have to remind ourselves, different is different. Different isn't bad. Of course, for some, and maybe for most, this discrimination, this bigotry that comes from inside us is based on our own assumed superiority. We see others. We see that they are different. It makes us feel better about ourselves to say, my race or my culture or my political party or my whatever is superior to those individuals. Europeans and those of European descent have spent an awful lot of time in the last couple of hundred years trying to scientifically validate their bigotry. Uh, Almost everyone is familiar with Charles Darwin and his book on evolution. Most folks only know the first five words of the title. The title actually is On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And part of what Darwin was trying to prove was this idea that Europeans, white guys like him, had evolved to a higher standard than other races. And so he was trying to, in, in a sense, put some scientific backing Other people like Margaret Sanger, who was the one that started Planned Parenthood, took this idea of the uh, evolution of European races above other races and supported this idea of eugenics, founded Planned Parenthood as a reason 
uh, or as a method to control the births of people of color because she wanted to believe scientifically, put that in quotes, that Europeans had evolved beyond the people of culture because our, uh, I'm sorry, the people of color because our cultures were so different from theirs. But it's not just scientific. You see, there are some tribes in Africa that for centuries have said, essentially, we have been blessed by the gods and we are better. And these tribes teach their children uh, that you are superior and they teach other children who are minority tribes within those countries and within those areas that you are an inferior lot. Um, and then you see in Asia, you'll see the same thing. Different cultures compete with one another, will challenge each other. We're superior. We have the superior culture to your culture, etc. So this idea of we just, we see the differences and we automatically say our difference is better than your difference. Again, difference is different. Different isn't bad and different doesn't mean that one is better than the other. We've seen a lot of bigotry down through the years uh, based basically on scapegoating. Something goes wrong. I don't want to take responsibility. Maybe something goes wrong and no one's responsible. Chaotic, random things happen in the world, tornadoes and fires, etc. But often when those things happen, we look for someone to blame. And so we scapegoat the people who look different than us. Political figures, of course, have always used this idea, right? We automatically think Nazi Germany, but it's been everywhere in all political strains in all countries. Politicians will use this idea. Let's blame them. Oh, it's the immigrants that are causing that. Oh, it's the big businesses that are causing that. So there's always kind of this scapegoating idea that gets used. Sometimes, frankly, we're just jealous of a different group Um, we don't understand them. We see that they're doing or having things that we don't have, and it could be a jealousy issue. And then finally, one of the things, again, this starts within us, but when we see others doing or when others are accepting of it, it can really amplify our own internal desires, our own, and really, as James said, bring that sin to birth, um, is to assign the character of one person to the entire group. Now, we call that stereotyping. I'm going to speak about that more in the next podcast, in the part three of this, uh, but just understand that's a very real issue. So the number one point is we have to understand that sin comes from within us, and any bigotry, racism, stereotyping, discrimination that I've done, I'm responsible for. And Jesus would say, look inside yourself, pray to clean yourself before you blame, well, I only act this way because my dad, my uncle, etc. Jesus says that's not acceptable. Here's my second point. In America, for understandable reasons, we tend to think of bigotry almost exclusively as racism. And we really tend to think of racism almost exclusively as white on black racism. Obviously, in this country and in others down through time, that's been a big issue. Racism is a massive uh, component of bigotry. And in our country, in the United States of America, white on black racism has been the dominant form uh, for decades, if not centuries, in this country. But we have to understand that's not the only issue. And here's why Jesus would say that that's important. It's too easy then for me to go, oh, well, I'm not a racist. I know how I feel inside. And I know how I feel about it. I have friends or I've dated or I'm married to or whatever, a person of color, and I'm not bigoted against them at all. So I'm off the hook. Jesus would say, well, wait a minute, not so fast. Just because you're a white person who likes a black person or just because you're a Latino who's married to an Asian doesn't let you off the hook because there's more to bigotry than just race. And there's more to racism even than just white on black. I mean, here's the honest truth. In our culture today, I see sexism as perhaps being the most prevalent form of bigotry. It is a white man. I've sat in room with other white men thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And rarely does a really pure racially bigoted comment come up. It has come up. And every time someone has brought it up, someone else in the group has challenged them that it is wrong. But I can sit in that same room with those same grown men and sexist comments will come up 10 times, 20, 
fit times 50 times as often as a racial comment would come up and are far less likely to be pushed back against. So I know we think in America, well, yeah, kind of the entertainment business. I mean, Hollywood and some of the songs that are written, they really do portray women as just sexual objects who exist for the use and the pleasure of men. But that's just that weird realm of, no, it's not just that weird realm of entertainment in society, in part because that weird realm has infected all of us and Women are seen and treated often, I think, in our society as just being sexual objects as opposed to being creatures, humans made in the image of God, made for His glory, given purpose in His kingdom. So I would actually argue sexism is a major, major issue, especially for men, obviously. And I really think, uh, again, it's too easy to let ourselves off the hook. But we need to understand across the globe today, there is racism in all different forms and fashions. But there are many other types of bigotry out there. Jesus needs us to understand this so that we're sensitive to the fact that even if we don't fall uh, guilty of this particular form of bigotry, we may fall guilty of of another. Let me just give you a couple of examples real quick. I mean, historically, You would have to probably say the Jews have been the most persecuted minority of all time, and it just kind of never stops. I continue to hear European politicians and American politicians who continue to say the most anti-Semitic things, and it's just devastating to think that that still goes on and it's still sort of quote-unquote approved of. China is just notorious for their treatment of the Muslim Uyghurs and the Buddhist Tibetans. And again, in both cases, their bigotry and their very maltreatment of these two groups, it's based on both kind of a blend of ethnic and religious aspects. They're not, they're not fond of the Uyghurs or the, or the, of the Tibetans, and they're definitely not fond of the Muslims and the Buddhists. And so there's some real serious treatment. In fact, if you just go and Google Chinese Uyghurs, it's spelled with a U, U-I-G-H-U-R, there'll be all sorts of articles about how They've been interned in camps in China. They're used for slave labor. They're killed. They actually harvest their organs and so forth. Uh, There's some real serious discrimination and and bigotry going on there. There's a group of people called the Kurds, a, a separate ethnic people called the Kurds. They are Muslim and they live in Muslim areas. So they're not really persecuted for their religion, but primarily or exclusively really for ethnic reasons. The Kurds do not have their own homeland. So they uh, um, they cover a portion of Turkey, a, a smaller portions of Iraq and Syria and Iran, and they are essentially persecuted and mistreated in every one of those countries and have been for a long, long time. There's a group of people living in a country called Myanmar. It used to be called Burma, uh, the Rohingya people. The Rohingya people are Muslim, and Myanmar, uh, the the Burmese, are Buddhist. And the Rohingya people have recently been brutally discriminated against, um, murdered and so forth, ran out, uh, made refugees in other places because of the religious difference uh, between them and the Buddhist uh, Burmese uh, the Hmong people, and, and the Hmong live in Southeast Asia. They live in various places. The place where they're suffering the most persecution uh, today is probably in Laos. Uh, the Hmong people are basically persecuted for political reasons in Laos. So in some places, you're persecuted for your religion. In other places, you're persecuted for your race or your ethnicity. Uh, the Hmong people in Laos are primarily being persecuted for political reasons, If we think back, probably the worst political bigotry ever has been the communist. Communism in the 20th century alone killed about 100 million people due to political discrimination. I can go on and on with this. There's been tribal fighting among two different black tribes in Rwanda, the Hutu and the Tutsis. Uh, Again, racially, they're the same. Religiously, they're the same. There's just tribal differences. In 1994 alone, just in one year, 800,000 Tutsis died. Bill Clinton had to work with the UN to intervene 
800,000 Tutsis died and 2 million were forced out of their country as refugees, all because there's a tribal difference between these two groups. And on and on it goes. Today in America, we still continue to see hate crimes of white against black. But you see, most of the Asian hate crimes that get reported are actually Africans, Amer- African Americans committing hate crimes against Asians. So again, the point of, of, of this second point is just this. There are all types of bigotry and racism. And what Jesus wants you to say is not what do I see? But what might I do? What might I be guilty of? Do I dislike people from different cultures, speak a different language? Do I not care for immigrants because I'm an American? Do I think differently of this? If I'm a male, am I a sexist, basically? Do I really think about and look at and talk about women in a way that really would make Jesus Christ shudder, etc.? And then the third point really kind of relates to these first two. Jesus would say, here's what I need you to take away. I need you to know that my plan, as with everything, address yourself first. That's what Jesus would say. Address yourself first. He would say, I understand in America that whites, I think a lot of people would actually say white males, were the only real group that had the status to systematically discriminate against other people. That is probably true. White males historically have really been the only group that had that status, that power, that economic leverage to systematically discriminate against others. But it doesn't mean that each one of us in our own way can't be a bigot or a sexist or a racist. And so Jesus would say, Look at yourself first. And if you say, yeah, but I want to cure the big problems in society, Jesus would still say every type of bigotry, every type of bigotry, no matter how big or how small, whether it's racial or sexual or cultural, every type serves to feed and perpetuate bigotry of all sizes and all types. So Jesus is going to say, before you can fix the problem in a larger society, if that's what you feel called to do, first, look at yourself and cleanse yourself. Be honest with yourself. And I can just give you the one verse. It's a very famous verse. I'll give you one verse. It's from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 3, Jesus tells us, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Simply Jesus's way of saying, I'm not saying you shouldn't go try to make the world a better place. Have at it. Here's the problem. Oftentimes the sins that we're guilty of in one shade are the sins that bother us the most on the outside. And so we have to be very careful. Why is that speck bothering me so much in my brother's eye? Well, maybe because I've got a bigger stick in my own. So Jesus would say, the first thing that you need to do is address yourselves. The second thing I think that we need to do is if we see bigotry in someone else, don't broaden that stereotype out. So it is not fair to say that all white people, all white men, all men, period, all Republicans, all Democrats, all Northerners, all Yankees, all none of them are all evil, but none of them are also completely innocent. And so it's, again, it's important for us to look at ourselves, not stereotype those around us, but be honest in looking at ourselves and take the speck or the plank or the log out of our own eye first, our bigotry, our discrimination, our racism, our sexism, our socioeconomic snobbery or whatever it is that affects us, cleanse that first with the help of scripture, church, prayer, the Holy Spirit. uh, And then we can move on to working in society to eliminate those evils as well. All right, folks, I'm going to do a part three on this. Now we're going to talk about the story of the Good Samaritan, pull some lessons out of that. But until then, this is Andy.